Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's web seminar on providing comprehensive sexual health education to foster youth. My name is Amy Lemley. We're right at 10 o'clock. And uh, per our custom here, we're going to give people a minute or two to join today's web seminar, get settled in with their coffee, and um, hopefully have um, a good experience learning about uh, this exciting pilot. Okay, so we'll get started in about a minute or two. Thank you. All right, um, let's jump in and get started. Um, again, welcome today to today's web seminar, Providing Comprehensive Sexual Health Education to Foster Youth, Lessons Learned from ALA Pilot. Um, before we jump into today's content, uh, we're going to just make sure everyone's able to access the web seminar. Um, here you, on the slide, you have the information to participate, the call-in number and the access code. As usual, uh, we will post the materials and the audio on our website. And we have been doing something new, uh, which I think uh, people have requested for a long time, is you should all have access to the presentation now on the control panel. Um, you can download it as a PDF. So if you want to print that out, take notes as we go along. Uh, we're, we're finally have uh, gotten to it, and you're able to do that. So the most interesting part, I find, are your questions. You know, uh, laws are very tidy. Um, and they seem like everything's going to go great, but we know in practice that often isn't the case. Um, and so send us your questions, send us your comments. Um, we'll do our best to get through all of them, and we will, um, you know, summarize those at the end of the web seminar and the document. So today we have a really wonderful group of people to uh, present. Uh, we're going to start with my colleague, Simone Turek Lee, who is the Pol Associate Policy Director at the John Burton Advocates for Youth. Uh, we'll also hear from Arlene Alger at Altamed, um, Liz Lizette Caldera of Altamed, and then rounding us out will be Rebecca Taylor, Taylor who is a doctorate student at Samuel Merritt University. Um, it's going to be, um, I think, a good conversation about the experience of this uh, pilot. Our agenda is a little bit of background information on the sexual health of foster youth, just to kind of set the stage. Um, to give a little bit of context about why we're having this conversation, why this pilot happened, um, and what we're trying to address. Uh, we'll turn from there to information about a Senate Bill 89, and this is legislation that was uh, went into effect on July 1st, 2017, uh, to improve the uh, sexual health of foster youth. Um, and then from there, we're going to turn to the actual pilot. Um, the who, what, when, where, why, and, uh, and then conclude with, you know, what are some steps, if you're interested in doing something like this in your county, what are the practical next steps you can take? And so we've done our best to really break that down into actionable uh, next steps. Um, so, but what's important to start with, slide please, is uh, that this work is really made possible uh, because of our participation as an organization in the Los Angeles Reproductive Health Equity Project. Uh, this is a very exciting project uh, that's funded by the Conrad and Hilton Foundation. Um, and it's really a partnership, as you can see, between adult advocates and foster youth to address and dismantle systemic barriers to improve access to sexual and reproductive health care services. So the goal is to increase that access and reduce the number of unintended pregnancies. Um, I've been involved in a lot of different efforts, and I'm really encouraged about the collaboration that's happening at LA Rep. Um, LA Rep recently launched their newsletter, uh, which is a, I believe it's monthly or every six weeks, very concise uh, summary of, uh, of this issue and its relevance in California and LA County. Um, and they also have a, you know, I should say we have an excellent uh, website um, where they've you know, just done a great job of taking the most relevant information on this topic, summarizing it, 
um, in a way that's easy to access. And so um, very excited about the project. Hope you'll visit the website, uh, sign up for the newsletter. And uh, the, the LA rep is, uh, there's a leadership team. And this slide just tells you who's on that leadership team. It's a wonderful collection of organizations. We feel very uh, proud to be part of that group. And I think the real standout in this group is LADCF itself. It's really a public and private partnership. And so we feel extremely fortunate to be working hand in hand with LADCFS to address this important issue, um, most specifically in Los Angeles, but it certainly has ripple effects um, across the state. So now for why we're here, and I'm going to talk through these quite quickly because we have a lot of, lot of information to get through, but it is important to note that the pregnancy rates for youth in foster care are running counter to the national trend. Um, and so we, thanks to uh, researchers like Emily Putnam Hornstein and her team and Mark Courtney and his team, we ha are in a golden age of information about the reproductive and sexual health of foster youth. You can see at age 17 and age 19, foster youth are experiencing pregnancy at anywhere from you know, two times to 2.5 times the general population. Um, so again, the rest of uh, the general population has gone down 77% since 1991. The question is how can we help young people who are in foster care experience that same uh, trend? Uh, so not surprisingly high rates of uh, of uh, pregnancy are relating in higher rates of birth, of birth. And so this is the wonderful study done by Emily Putnam Hornstein combined with the most recent Cal Youth study. Um, Professor Putnam Hornstein's study looked at young people who were in care at age 18, um, if they'd had a first birth before 18, 19, 20, and then 21. And you can see, you know, over one in three uh, had a first birth by age 21 of those who were in care at 18. And then uh, Mark Courtney's recent age 21 cohort survey came out and found it was even a wee bit higher at 38.6% of, of young women had a birth by age 21. And um, so this has you know, very important implications uh, for young people in care as well as for their children. Um, certainly uh, the access to higher education um, and so uh, the Cal Youth study asked young people who were not enrolled, who had been enrolled in school and were not currently enrolled, what some of the key factors are for preventing them from returning. And a major factor cited by young people was, uh, was, the, was the child care. I think we all know child care is tremendously expensive. Um, and for young people who are aging out of care or formerly in care, um, you know, that, that uh, is even more complicated. Uh, you know, access to stable living wage employment, uh, having a child very young has implications for that as well. Uh, so a study found they're 30% like, less likely to be employed, even when holding education constant. Um, and that certainly does relate to access to child care. Um, and then again, you know, we have a, according to the Cal Youth study, a full 14.8% of youth who, who have had sex have had an STD by age 21. Um, significantly greater than the general population. And so this kind of comes together to how do we, you know, something as sensitive um, and important as uh, reproductive and sexual health, something that's often in the private domain of families, how do we think about that in our child welfare system? And how do we begin to ensure that we are not um, missing this important aspect of health? Um, and, and to do that, uh, Senator Connie Leva uh, passed SB, next slide please, um, was the author of Senate Bill 245. Now that bill was later morphed into um, SB 89. That was the kind of omnibus social services budget bill that passed, but originally it was SB 245. Um, and Senator Connie Leva is, you know, a progressive champion, uh, sponsoring lots of great legislation for uh, the most vulnerable Californians. And um, SB 89 includes a lot of different provisions and this isn't an SB 89 training. Uh, we're not gonna talk through all of those, but it does include case plan provisions and a training provision for all social workers, caregivers, and judges. Um, it went into effect on July 1st, 2017. And then we also have the ACL issued, which operationalizes SB 89. 
Um, so, you know, progress is underway um, and, and, and more to come. So kind of, I want to kind of, you know, you know, make the connection between SB 89 and comprehensive sex, uh, sex education. So what many people do, don't realize and what I didn't realize before SB 245 um, is that since 2016, the California Healthy Youth Act has required all students in California, public school students, to receive comprehensive sexual health education. So this was a much larger, broader reform in the public education space. Um, and so uh, this, this applies to my child who is in public school and if your child who's in public school, um, a very broad coalition um, of, of people came together to pass this uh, really amazing piece of legislation. And at the bottom of the webpage, if you really want to learn about it, I recommend going to that webpage. It's a very good webpage. There's FAQs, there's fact sheets, um, there's everything you want to know um, about uh, the California Healthy Youth Act. These few bullets I have are the very high level summary. In a nutshell, what it does is it says that you know, every public school student has to have comprehensive sexual health education once in middle school and once in high school. Um, and, uh, and it's very specific about what comprehensive sexual health education is. Um, it's certainly not what I had in seventh grade. Uh, this is a very thoughtful, very rigorous set of criteria. And um, on that website, uh, when you read it, you will really see the breadth of content that is there. Uh, it's not something that can be covered in one session. In some schools, um, it's covered over a whole semester. So this is a very, again, thoughtful, rigorous set of requirements that are part of the California Healthy Youth Act. Um, and it must affirmatively recognize that people have different sexual orientations. It's very explicit that abstinence may not be discussed in isolation. It requires uh, the curriculum to be age appropriate and medically accurate and objective. And then districts around California are meeting this requirement with a range of strategies. Um, that's a little bit of the hard part. That's the complicated part. You know, we have almost 1,800 um, local education agencies, um, you know, what I think of as a school district, um, some very, very big, um, some not so big. Um, and the California Healthy Youth Act puts forth what the standard is, and then the district uh, determines how it's going to meet that standard. Uh, so the next slide. And so you might be saying, okay, that's great, Amy. What does that have to do with kids in foster care? So what SB 89 does is it really closes the loop. It's, it really requires the caseworker to ensure that the schools have fulfilled this mandate. The mandate is on the public school. That is where the mandate is. Now, however, uh, what SB 89 does is it says we want to make sure this very, very vulnerable population of young people gets access to this incredibly important content. Now, if uh, it was a child in my home or, or not a child in foster care, um, if they missed it, you know, a parent or someone else may cover it. But given the heightened risk of young people who are in foster care and the level of placement instability and mobility that often, often occurs, the whole idea behind SB 89 or this provision of SB 89 is we want to make sure that they receive it. Uh, and when they receive it, SB 89 requires that to be indicated in the case plan. So what you have here is a very simplified flowchart. Um, and you know there are uh, caseworkers all around California and counties all around California figuring out right now how they are operationalizing this checking feature. So the first question that, that we ask ourselves is, you know, did a foster youth receive comprehensive sexual health education uh, once in middle school and once in high school. So let's say you have a middle schooler who um, is being served. Um, and there's going to be a lot of different strategies employed by different county, counties to determine that. And so that, that really isn't the purpose of today's web seminar. So counties will employ those different strategies. Uh, I know that uh, Los Angeles is, is actively working on the strategy it will be using and counties around California are as well. 
Um, so let's say the answer is yes. Now you might say 95%. Now that is not, uh, our hope is that 95% of the time that the child will receive that comprehensive sexual health education in school. Um, and you might say, well, why? Why is it best to receive it in school? Um, and it's really due to the comprehensive nature of the curriculum. The more you learn, and the more I've learned about uh, the California Healthy Youth Act, the more you realize that the delivery of it really requires someone who's deeply knowledgeable about the content. It's much more than putting a condom on a banana and, and talking um, uh, lightly about the issue of comprehensive sexual health. Um, it's a, again, it's an excellent set of criteria, but it's an extensive set of criteria. And the school settings where schools are um, investing in curricula, investing in trainers, and integrating this into their school curriculum, that is the setting where, um, where, we're, where we hope that most of our foster youth receive it. But we don't know if that's going to be the case or not, truthfully. Um, so about, you know, some will not. Um, and, you know, so for those who do not, if you go to the flow chart to the far right, SB 89 requires the caseworker to document how that requirement will be met. Um, and so it kind of puts the ball in the child welfare system's court. Um, it squarely does, frankly. So we, we work with the school to say, yes, let's have the child receive this in school. If they can't or if they don't, then the child welfare system is left answering this question. And, and how to answer that question, that is today's web seminar. That is what we're really talking about. Um, so, but I do want to kind of throw out some initial ideas about how to, how to, how to, how to get to that 95%. You can go back one more. Thank you. Um, because we know there is a lot of school mobility. There's a lot of things going on in the life of a foster youth. Um, and so those few little bullets you see by that box are a few different strategies. And our organization, together with uh, many other organizations, are going to be working to, um, to put some more flesh on the bone here. Um, taking the course out of grade sequence. We know many districts are offering it in middle school in grade seven. So let's say a young person transfers into the school in grade eight and they haven't gotten it in seventh grade. Um, so that would be seeing if the student can take it out of sequence. Uh, some districts are addressing this through summer school. Other ones are looking into independent study courses. And you know, this one is a, is, you know, uh, maybe a long shot, but, but working with your district to say what flexibility could there be taking it, you know, at a different school within the district. Uh, so again, there's going to be a range of strategies to try and uh, to do this, but I really want to encourage everyone to, to work with their school district to, to answer this question and not to rush to solve this problem because, again, the schools are the ones who are in the business of, of administering this curriculum. They're thinking about meeting this need for all of their students. Uh, and so rather than doing um, something outside of the education system, um, try to drive them to what is happening in our public education system. Now, that being said, we know that's not always possible. And so today, again, we're going to talk about when that isn't possible, you know, to stimulate some thinking for those of you who are from CBOs or from counties to think, how are we going to, how are we going to meet this need in our, in our counties? And that's kind of, again, what today's web seminar is about. Uh, we're going to hear about a pilot that was implemented in LA. We're going to learn about the curriculum that was used, the structure of the pilot, who participated, how much it cost, lessons learned, and we're going to hear what young people thought about it. Um, so we're, um, not to bury the lead too much, um, as my husband says sometimes about our newsletter articles, um, but we did want to explain where this, um, you know, where this pilot fits into SB 89 so you can think about it in partnership with your county partners and figure out as a county what the right way to proceed is because we know there's a lot of uh, different approaches around the state uh, and this is intended to stimulate that thinking and to be a catalyst to start that conversation. So for here, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Simone. 
Thanks, Amy. Um, so we're going to talk about this pilot, as Amy mentioned, but kind of before we jump into the nitty gritty of the pilot, we really want to just acknowledge Los Angeles County. Um, LA County has really been a leader um, in this area, kind of addressing this issue of um, reproductive health needs of foster youth. They've done a number of things over several years to um, really target this issue. Um, for probably 10 years or so, LA has been convening a work group of advocates and county reps to address reproductive needs of foster youth. They have the, what are called the EPI conferences, the Expectant and Parenting Youth Conferences um, for, for parents when youth are going to become parents. Um, they participated in the California Foster Youth Pregnancy Prevention Institute, along with you know, just a handful of other counties um, who are committed to, to making changes in their county to address the, the high rate of unintended pregnancy among foster youth. Uh, they're currently piloting a version of the infant supplement um, where youth who become pregnant can actually get the financial support um, that you get once you have a child statewide. Um, before they give birth so that they're able to kind of, you know, purchase items in preparation for baby versus just after the baby comes. Um, and of course, as Amy mentioned, they're a key member in the leadership team for LA Rep. And, and, and as such, they, you know, assisted us during the pilot um, that I'll share information about right now to help us conduct outreach. So thank you, LA, for, for being a leader. So just a quick, very kind of overview of the pilot, then we're going to hear about a curriculum, and then we're going to kind of dive into the details of the pilot. But just an overview here, you know, one of our roles um, uh, as part of LA Rep was to pilot offering comprehensive sexual education in a community setting to foster youth using a very specific curriculum called Making Proud Choices. So we contracted with staff who uh, do this for a living. They work for an organization called Ultimate, and you'll hear from them in just a second, um, to deliver the curriculum. We held four sets of what we called workshop series um, of either kind of three or four day sessions over the course of August of last year um, through April of this year. And we partnered with a number of, of organizations to do that. And uh, just again, kind of overview here. We provided a generous financial incentive that you'll hear more about later to participants. They could earn up to $150 for full participation um, and actually an additional 50 for completing a follow-up survey as part of a study that another one of the LA Rep partners is conducting. Um, we provided a meal. It was either over lunch or dinner. Um, lots of snacks, prizes for the games and the other activities that, that are part of the curriculum. And uh, we either provided a transportation stipend kind of on top of the financial incentive, or in some cases, Children's Law Center, which is the organization that employs all the dependency attorneys for LA County um, and also an LA rep member, um, provided like an Uber or a Lyft for their clients um, or some sort of transportation support um, if, you know, if they were their clients, meaning if they were current dependents. So again, I'm going to just pause for a second before we get into all of these details, and I'd like to ask Lisa from Altamed to talk about what Making Proud Choices is. Hi, good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Lizette, and I covered, um, I was one of the health educators that helped implement um, and pilot test the MPC in LA County. So just to go over the curriculum for a little bit, um, there are multiple versions of Making Proud Choices, um, and this curriculum is intended to prevent HIV, STD, and teen pregnancy. So there is a California edition, which includes um, both school and community-based versions. Those are typically between 9 and 9.5 hours. Um, there's also the version that we implemented with um, John Burton Advocates for Youth for um, in out of home care youth. Um, and that one was about 12.5 hours. And there, this curriculum is also available in Spanish for the community-based um, version. So it's owned and disseminated by ETR. Um, we, it's, it's typically intended for classes of six to 12 participants, but in some cases, um, the cap size is 24. So if there are 24 youth, um, there will be two educators and anything, um, anything from six to 12 would be one educator. So typically it's intended for youth um, between the ages of 12 and 18. If there is parenting youth, we um, can implement this curriculum for youth between 19 and 21. 
and it is an adaptation from these I would be responsible. So moving on, we making proud choices is if we can go to the next slide. Making proud choices is actually um made up of four main components. So there is the goals and dreams. Um, goals, dreams, is adolescent sexuality. So this curriculum typically starts with um we're filling out a sheet where they get to cover um, and write down. It's a timeline where they get to write down um, at least one or two goals that they've already accomplished as of the date that we see them. And then they get to look forward into five years and write at least one or two goals or dreams that they have for the, during over the next five years. And then in the next section, they go over goals and dreams that they would like to accomplish within 10 years. So this kind of sets the tone for the um, curriculum and the implementation so that they kind of get an idea of how their choices um, that they make on a daily basis can have an impact on their goals and dreams in the long run. So once we've established that, we go into knowledge. So there's also the component of knowledge. Um, so we do go over how does someone get an STD? So what behaviors put me at risk for pregnancy? How can I prevent pregnancy? Um, how can I prevent STDs and HIV? So we make sure to cover um, the obvious, such as not sharing needles, putting a condom on before any contact, um, using birth control to prevent pregnancy, um, and we do cover abstinence. We do let them know that that is the one way that they can prevent um, STDs, HIV, and teen pregnancy 100%. But we do um, go into detail if they do decide to have sex, um, that condoms and birth control are their best bet. Um, we also go into PEP and PEP when it comes to HIV. We also take um, a look at their beliefs and attitudes. So I, a lot of the times youth um, choose not to engage in protected intercourse because they feel that condoms interfere with sexual pleasure or um, they believe their partner is not going to um, be, uh, not going to agree to use condoms. So a lot of the times we take a moment um, throughout the curriculum to make sure that we talk about how um, how we can shift that and essentially um, how we can how they can have conversations with their partners um, to make sure that they address um, their concerns and their beliefs. Um, we also, in order to do that, we also help them develop skills and self-efficacy. So there are um, there are presentations where we cover role play and essentially what they're doing is they're trying to cover where they're trying to develop skills where they can have these conversations with their partners and um, and share why it is important for them um, and why their goals and dreams are important and how having a baby at a, such an early age can actually be an obstacle, not necessarily make things impossible, but have a negative um, influence um, and make things a little bit harder to achieve. So when it comes to skills and efficacy, we also like to cover, um, see there are techniques that we cover such as um, one of them is called the SWAT technique so we um, help them develop skills on how to get out of a risky situation how to set physical limits um, and it's again communication so we try to have them practice these skills so through scripted um, and unscripted role play they get to develop these skills and um, really see and kind of get a feel for what it's like in real life so this curriculum does a great job in making sure that they practice throughout the curriculum so moving on to the next slide, we have um, there are a variety of component of ways that we can go about teaching um, these methods, right? So how to prevent STDs, HIV, and teen pregnancy. And there's role playing, as I mentioned a little bit ago. There's skill building. Um, there's definitely brainstorming. So there's also parts throughout the curriculum where we cover. Um, you know, what are your goals and dreams? What are the obstacles? Um, what do you guys think are ways to overcome these obstacles? So essentially, they're doing the thinking, and we're just facilitating along the, along the way. Um, there's small group discussions. There's a lot of videos, and there's a lot of games and activities. So one that you, too, that you really, um, really enjoy doing um, and participating in is actually um, there's an HIV risk continuum where there is a green zone, a yellow zone, and in a red zone, um, green being the less risky, absolutely no risk of getting HIV, um, the red being the riskiest, so if you engage in a behavior, that would be a considered a red behavior. So we give each um, student a card, and essentially what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to go put, um, that, that card holds a behavior. So based on the behavior that they each receive, they go up um, and they tape it in the zone that they think it goes. 
So we've noticed that they really enjoy um, in this activity. So one of the behaviors would be kissing. Um, that one would go in the green zone. So we like to address how a lot of the times um, there is pressure to have sex with their partner, but there are other ways that um, that teens and youth and anyone in um, general can actually display um, and show affection for the partner and show that they care without necessarily having to engage in intercourse. Um, so we also have a lot of, um, we have the, a, a, a game where they get to, um, we test their knowledge. So there's so many activities throughout this curriculum that help um, really um, engrave these beliefs and attitudes into them so that they can practice them in the future. So moving on to the next slide. There were a couple of findings. So it is an evidence-based curriculum, which I, I feel it's very important to know um, and be aware of. So from the original curriculum, um, youth were definitely more likely to delay having sex and more likely to use a condom when they did have sex. So compared to youth that did not um, participate in making felt choices. So there are particularly strong impacts on youth who were sexually active prior to the program. When from a 2013 evaluation for the out-of-home care version, 88% um, of youth did report that the program helped them learn more about preventing pregnancy, um, while 89% of youth reported that it helped them learn um, more about STI prevention, and 84% reported that they could um, re recommend the class to a friend. So we definitely receive a lot of positive feedback from youth. They really um, enjoy it. We um, we develop a relationship with these youth over the over the course of the implementation, um, where a lot of the times people are leaving, they're like, "Oh, we don't want you guys to leave. We really enjoyed the program. So you guys made it so much fun." So essentially, it's it's really the curriculum that's um, guiding us, and they're really they they really have um, expressed positive um, feedback on that. So that I'm going to hand it over to. Thanks, Lisa. Simone, no problem. Thank you, Thank you for that <laughs> overview of making proud choices. Um, this is where we're going to kind of get into more details about the the pilot and who participated, um, and what what really the pilot consisted of, what we learned. Um, so I'm going to kind of go very quickly over who participated. There there will be a web seminar in November um, that will talk about the study that. Um, one of the other LA Rep members, Seattle Children's Hospital, um, is conducting, and it was kind of, it was an evaluation of the delivery of making proud choices um, in this setting. And so, all of this kind of demographic information, along with additional findings, will be shared on that web seminar. But we did want to just briefly talk about, you know, who were the youth that participated. And as you can see on the screen. Um, we uh, kind of after the first workshop series, we opened it. Uh, we opened this up to all current and former foster youth, ages 18 to 24, in LA County. The first one we did a little bit different. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But uh, a total of 89 youth participated in some form. So maybe they didn't attend every single session, but they did show up for at least one session. And then 55 of those youth attended all sessions. So either all three sessions or all four sessions, depending on how long that workshop series was. And um, you know that's a pretty good uh, completion rate, if you ask me. Um, we were really impressed uh, with the young people who who participated. Um, now, I'm sorry if the you know the the charts on here are a little bit jumbled. It looks like with the on the race ethnicity side, but if we start on the gender side, you can see that the participants were predominantly female. Um, moving over to race race ethnicity, uh, the largest single demographic was um, Hispanic, Latino, then Black, African American, and uh, the other um, ethnic groups are smaller proportions. Um, when we talk about uh, kind of placement and housing, now this is not set up in a way that I think we usually look at foster care placements. Usually you see like group home, FFA home, county foster home, THP plus FC, you know, um, this is set up a little bit differently. Now this was current and former foster youth. This was more about kind of their housing setting than just specific placements. So the first category you can see is a large majority, 56%, were in what was referred to as transitional or independent living. So that could be in a SILP, in a what we call a supervised independent living placement for current foster youth, that could be in a transitional housing placement, THP plus FC. 
um, for current foster youth or for former foster youth in a THP plus program. So this is, you know, um, any of those kind of all of the above of those um, those settings. And then the others are pretty straightforward. Um, as you can see, um, you know, one, two, three of those are actual foster care placements. Um, but again, these are more about kind of the living setting. Um, school enrollment. So the majority of youth that, that attended these were enrolled in school, 63% of those youth, you know, these were older youth, 18 to 24, um, just 16% were still completing high school, 82% um, were in college, and then 2% um, said that they were in some sort of vocational training. Um, and then when we talk about kind of, again, this will be talked about in way more depth in the November webinar, but just kind of looking at what is the, um, what is the reality for the youth that, that showed up for these kind of as far as experience with pregnancy and parenting, experience with um, STIs, you can see that 28%, you know, had reported ever being pregnant or having gotten a, a partner pregnant and 55% reported never having done that. 5% were currently pregnant um, or had a partner who was currently pregnant. Um, and as far as STIs go, 13% um, reported having ever been diagnosed with an STI um, with just under three quarters um, having never been diagnosed. And then when it comes to testing, um, the majority had been tested, 62%, um, and 27% had never been tested. And you'll learn more kind of in the November webinar about how being and making proud choices changed youth's kind of attitudes, behaviors, um, beliefs, um, and uh, yeah, and behaviors, which is really key. So did they go out and get tested after, um, you know, participating in the, the workshop series and um, kind of uh, as far as risk-taking behaviors, did those change? And so, of course, that we're all very interested to, to hear about that. So getting into participation rates, and this is where I think a lot of our learnings live. Um, we'll talk, we have some slides later, kind of what did we learn, but I'll kind of start that conversation here. Um, we, we held four workshop series, and the first one we did in August, and we kind of looked at that as like the pilot of our pilot, you know, we kind of looked at it as our first run. Let's kind of see how this works. We had a very brave and willing partner, David and Margaret Youth and Family Services, um, partnered with us on this. They are a THP Plus and THP Plus provider in Laverne. They do other things as well, but that is kind of our relationship with them. Um, and uh, we, as I mentioned, kind of after this first workshop series, we did open it up to all current and former foster youth. However, for this first workshop series, we strictly worked with David and Margaret. Um, we tried this model where we only invited youth from David and Margaret. Now, these, as Lisette mentioned, you know, these sessions are meant to be held in small groups. So we thought, well, let's build, you know, just working with one transitional housing provider, like let's build this group of 10 to 12 youth. And the program director at David and Margaret and, and the staff there did considerable outreach. They did a ton of work to, to um, get youth there and get youth signed up. Um, but as all of you know who uh, who have held events for youth, attendance is really difficult. Um, it's hard to, for, to get youth to show up. Um, and, uh, and even though we just did want a small, we wanted a small class size, um, we realized that, you know, this model of kind of just partnering with one provider would probably make it challenging to fill every workshop. And it puts a lot of kind of uh, expectation and responsibility on, on the provider who can't force youth to show up and shouldn't be forcing youth to show up. Um, and so we thought, let's open it up much, much wider kind of after this first workshop. But I do want to acknowledge um, David and Margaret um, for being our first uh, kind of our first partner in this. Um, and it was, it was such a great experience and the youth were so great uh, that attended. You can see, you know, of the nine youth that attended um, over the course of this, and I should have mentioned this one was set up um, four days, one day a week. So uh, over the course of a month. So it was like a Tuesday, it was like every other Tuesday in August, every other Friday in August, I believe is what it was. So youth were attending once per week for that month. Um, and uh, we got you know, out of the nine youth total, five youth attended all four of those sessions. So for the second workshop series, we, we kind of found our sweet spot um, for a number of reasons. We had kind of, we had a number of things going for us on this one. Um, first, this workshop series was held over three consecutive days, which I think did help with minimizing drop-off. 
Um, we also held it during winter break. And as you saw on the previous slides, a lot of these youth were in school. And so this minimized kind of scheduling conflicts. Yes, many of them also may have been working, but um, it, it really helped to, to do it during a break. Um, and uh, we, again, we opened this one up kind of to all current and former foster youth in the county of Los Angeles. Um, so we had a very large pool to draw from. It was not just first place. And um, a really important thing here was that it was held at First Place's Wilshire location, which is literally located um, on top of a metro stop. So talk about kind of, you know, accessible, you know, accessibility transportation-wise, you kind of can't get better than that um, in LA. And we ended up having actually a much greater turnout than we expected at this one. And, and although the room was a little crowded, you know, it was intended for about half the size of the class, you know, first place was incredibly accommodating and welcoming of the youth coming in for the workshops. Um, and it was just, again, a really great experience. And so here of the 34 youth that attended, 27 of them attended all three days, which we thought was amazing. Um, and we're just really, um, you'll hear later youth are just they were excited to come back um, the third workshop series here was um, again we went back to holding it for four days because it wasn't over like a, a school break four days once per week and this was in February and we held this one in Monterey Park at Children's Law Center um, right next to Children's Court and uh, one thing we did notice about this one is that youth did struggle with getting to Monterey Park so as many of you probably know, LA is incredibly spread out. Um, so location is really important. Um, and as you'll hear later, you know, youth love this curriculum, so they, they trekked out there to, to, to make it. Um, and we definitely want to thank CLC, Children's Law Center. Um, they usually, you know, they're not in the business of kind of hosting these things um, at, at their building um, versus like first place holds a lot of things like this at their building. And so CLC really kind of went out of their way to, to make this work for us. Um, and of the 22 youth who attended this one, um, eight youth attended all four sessions. But there is a caveat here that, that I know that looks low. Um, on this one, uh, we ended up actually kind of inviting additional youth after the first session because we ironically at this one had more space <laughs> than the last one and so there was room. And so many of these youth started at session two, so it's not really fair to to look at that percentage, it's actually would be much higher if you included youth that attended all three sessions that they were um, kind of invited to attend. Um, and of course, could we change it, we would have gone back and, and started inviting them earlier, but we just, you just don't know who's going to show up, which is one of the, the challenges here with these things. And then again, the last workshop series, we, we held that again with first place, this time at their Lamert location. Um, and we did, again, a three-day intensive. This was held over spring break. Of the 24 youth, 14 youth attended all three days. Um, and thank you, First Place. If you know, if there's anyone listening from First Place um, for doing this with us twice, you guys were just so great, um, super accommodating. All, everyone we worked with um, on these were um, at all four of the, or all three of these organizations. And and you'll hear in the lessons learned um, that it's really important to hold these in locations that are youth friendly and welcoming. You know, it makes a significant difference. And, um, you know, we were lucky to work with really great partners on this pilot that made, um, overall made the experience really, really positive for youth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the cost breakdown. And, you know, we thought this would be helpful um, for those of you who are working for a county that's considering, you know, this might be something we have to do um, if we really cannot, you know, if we have youth who miss this. Um, in school and this, and we aren't able to somehow work with the school to, to get them this education, um, you might want to kind of think about what this might cost you. Um, so clearly a lot of these things vary. Um, for example, um, if you're contracting with educators or with a provider versus, you know, using a provider with existing funding to provide this education, obviously that first amount is going to come out. Um, and it also can really vary. Some people might pay the person they're contracting with $20 an hour and some might pay $60 an hour. It's, it's really going to range. We just kind of stuck a range here on of $50 to $100 an hour. Um, but again, that hourly rate could very much uh, vary. Um, 
And, uh, and as I said, if you're working with a comprehensive sexual education provider directly using their existing funding, such as um, the PrEP program, which you'll hear about later, um, or, you know, a pretty established high capacity Planned Parenthood, um, you, you obviously would remove this cost out. But in some cases, um, you, might, you might need to pay for it, right? Um, you might be in a county where that's not available. Um, so youth stipends also, again, very, uh, they can vary. Um, we chose to provide $150 per youth for attending all sessions. Um, the way that we structured it was we provided them a payment at the end of each session, um, but the amount grew each time they attended. So for a three-day session, for example, the first day they received $40, the second day $50, and the third day $60. And if a youth missed the second day, they couldn't come back to the third and get uh, the $60. They, they could come back, but they, they couldn't get the, the, the incentive. So the idea was really incentivizing full attendance. But, you know, if they showed up for day one, they'd get their $40, and if they didn't come back, they'd keep that $40, obviously. But it was about, about building on, on attendance. Um, they also received an additional $50 for completing a follow-up survey three months after the workshop series ended. Um, but this isn't included in this budget here just because this was something paid um, by the evaluator, Children's um, Seattle Children's Hospital. And, you know, unless you're doing a, an evaluation of this as you do it, uh, you probably wouldn't be providing that extra um, on there. So obviously you could choose to provide a lesser amount than 150 but we do strongly suggest providing some sort of incentive. Um, otherwise, attendance can be a challenge. And, and you know, uh, money talks, let's, let's be honest. Um, youth are motivated if they, if they know that, that they can get a little bit more cash in their pocket for attending. It's, it's a great incentive. Um, and, uh, you know, this is why it is the best case scenario for them to attend in school where they already are, right? Um, prizes. This is also a key part, you know, if you ask the educators who, who deliver this curriculum, you know, they, they told me, they put me up on game. They said, if you are, you know, able to really got to buy some like $5 gift cards or, you know, movie tickets, um, it's really makes the, it makes the day fun. It gets actually some healthy competition going when there's games. Um, and it's, it's nice to be able to leave youth with, with, you know, with a $5 Starbucks gift card um, that they can treat themselves to, right? Um, so, again, this is something that we recommend, but you wouldn't have to necessarily do what we did. This is kind of on the upper end. If you look at it, you know, one pair of movie tickets and three $5 gift cards per youth. So over the course of, you know, three or four days, that can add up. So um, you could opt to do something less um, costly, obviously. Catering, you really can't get around this one. If you're hosting during a mealtime particularly, um, you know, on average, we spend about probably $23 per youth each day on food, but this also includes snacks. We just kind of ordered snacks in bulk on Amazon. And then the food, obviously, we had catered from various places depending on where we were. Um, but it's so important to, to, to feed people when, you, as you all know, when you have ask them to show up for something, um, you got to have some good food. Lastly, you'll want to remember to factor in the cost of county staff time and or the cost of paying someone um, if you're going to contract out kind of the convener position, the convener role um, that we'll talk about a little bit later. I played this convener role um, for our sessions, but, um, you know, the county might want to have a community-based provider play this role or a county staff, you know, from ILP or somewhere like that um, play this role. And we'll talk again a little bit about that later. Um, so key lessons learned, you know, I've alluded to some of this already. Um, some of the key factors to success are, for one, um, location, um, location, 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 um, particularly in an area like L.A., but really in general, we hear it all the time, and, and this experience really reinforced it. Um, if you have to take a whole bunch of different buses to get to this thing, and it takes them hours, they're less likely to come. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to take a bus for two hours to go somewhere. Um, so for a county who's, you know, setting this up for youth who may have missed it in school and um, they can't somehow work with the school to get it, it would be really important to think about how to organize the workshop so that you're catering to youth from one geographic area, kind of clustering them, um, and then, uh, you know, not kind of pulling youth from, you know, that live an hour apart to one central location. That's going to be rough. 
um, you, you got to do what you got to do and what works for you. But ideally, um, clustering them geographically is really, um, particularly in larger counties with lots of traffic, um, is important or with poor transportation options, I should say also. Um, some older youth drive, um, so parking was really important, but I think for you know counties who are setting these up, um, more youth will probably be minors since this is, um, only includes non-minor dependents who are in high school. Um, and uh, you know, so this is probably not as much of an issue, but it was definitely in this pilot. Um, all of these things might seem obvious, but holding it in a space that's youth friendly, where youth feel welcomed makes a huge difference. Um, places that are set up for this type of event, you know, are, are ideal. Um, another uh, probably very obvious thing is, is the comfortable room. You know, um, we did have challenges in striking the right balance on the number of youth. Um, we sometimes had seemed to have too many youth in the smaller rooms, not enough youth in the larger rooms. You sometimes can't control this, but best case scenario is plan for a larger room and um, that's kind of playing it safe. Um, being a convener. So I referenced this earlier. But the role of the convener or the organizer um, is really important. You can't expect the educators to play this role. Making Proud Choices recommends two educators, but they're really both engaged in playing that educator role um, and, and can't kind of handle every logistical thing that comes up and certainly are not going to do kind of outreach and text reminders for you. Um, that's not, uh, not their job. Um, so whether a uh, county staff plays this role or you contract it out to a provider, um, this person needs to do a lot of work on the front end to make the workshop successful. So during the pilot, for example, we did a huge amount of outreach to get youth there um, for fulfilling the, the SB 89 mandate. This will be slightly different because you'll have a, a specific list you're working off of, but you need to still get those youth there. Someone needs to explain to them what this is, coordinate with their caretaker or their placement or them directly, um, arrange transportation maybe, sending multiple text reminders is a great idea leading up to each workshop. Um, someone also needs to literally arrange for the workshop to be held, so coordinating with the educators, arranging for the space, coordinating with that organization or entity, ordering, ordering the food, buying the gift cards, um, making sure all the necessary curriculum materials are in place, clarifying who's providing those. Are the educators providing those? Are you providing those? Um, making sure the room has capability to view videos and show PowerPoint, um, et cetera, et cetera. You guys know how this stuff goes. When you host an event, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so just think about that when you're when you're planning. Um, more uh, lessons learned here. As you probably gathered, the three-day intensive workshops um, series that we held over school breaks worked out best for youth, um, particularly because of uh, the youth, um, I think because the youth receiving this kind of, um, the counties might be setting this up for, they will be in school. Um, it makes the most sense to hold this over, say, a winter break or, or a summer. Um, Summer would be probably really great, and uh, you know, plus if you're kind of providing an incentive, um, you know, it gives you some extra cash during the summer, it keeps them out of trouble, gives them something to do. Um, summer is probably a great, a great time. Um, the curriculum sells itself, so you'll hear about this later. But I'll just say, um, youth showed up for the first day; they generally wanted to show up again. Um, providing transportation support. So as I mentioned, you have to hold these workshops in good locations, but you also need to help with transportation. Um, the most surefire way to get these there is literally probably to put them in an Uber or a Lyft or give them a ride, but if public transportation is a viable option, at least maybe providing them reimbursement for taking the bus or the metro um, is a good idea. Providing an incentive, I said this before, maybe you're not providing $150, but providing something um, makes a big difference. Um, and youth also prefer to receive something each day they were there versus, well, I have to show up and then all three days and then get it at the very end. Um, you know, they want to leave with something in hand each day. Um, food. So youth showed up hungry. There were a couple sessions that started in the afternoon and we were ordering dinner for them, but they asked, you know, can we eat earlier? Um, you know, I've skipped lunch or I skipped breakfast and lunch. Um, they're going to show up hungry, um, and they're they're adolescents, so they're going to be they're going to be hungry, um, and and youth definitely appreciate it. They appreciate the snacks. Uh, making sure that you have that you know adequate amounts is really important. Time management. So the curriculum might say it takes 12 and a half hours, for example, but that is what is um, you know just for education, just for instruction. That doesn't include time for sign in, for starting late maybe if that happens 
time for a survey if you're using one, for breaks, for the meal, um, for any individual questions or follow-up. Um, and for our workshops, the 12 and a half hour curriculum that was basically stretched over a course of 16 or 16 and a half hours to give you an idea. Child care. So obviously these are long days, four or five hours or more. The content is not appropriate for a young child to sit in on. So you can't really have youth just bring their kids and, and, and have them sit in on it. Um, so not having child care is a major barrier for parenting youth to attend. But we know that this demographic is really important that this reaches them. You know, once a youth has a child, there's, there is this higher likelihood that they're going to, you know, have a subsequent pregnancy um, or child. We didn't offer child care. And although we made sure that that was clear in our kind of promotional materials, we definitely had youth show up with their kids. Luckily, on both of those occasions, we were able to figure something out for those young people, thanks to the partners that we were working with. But it almost didn't happen. And, you know, hindsight, I wish we could have offered child care. Um, this is an important demographic, and we, we definitely want to make it accessible. Um, and acknowledgments culmination, the last thing here. This is something I didn't think of, and the educators at Ultimed suggested very strongly, you've got to do some sort of like certificate of completion and acknowledgement that youth are almost kind of graduating this course. Um, and so we did that, and it really made a difference. It's super low barrier. It's easy to do. It doesn't cost anything outside of, you know, printing some certificates, and it makes um, a big difference. So now I'm going to, and I just want to let people know, we are going to go a little bit over time. Um, and, you know, we hope that you're able to stay on. If you're not, this is being recorded, and you can listen to it at a later date. But now I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca. Um, Rebecca is a licensed nurse. She's currently a doctoral student at Samuel Merritt University, um, and she also happens to be one of our board members here at John Burton Advocates for Youth. And when she heard we were working on this project, she got really interested and kind of to skip to the end of the story, she is working with the evaluators at, Children's, at Seattle Children's Hospital on the study that is being conducted of the pilot um, as her dissertation. And um, as part of this, Rebecca also got trained as an educator for making proud choices and actually facilitated with Ultimate a few of the work, workshop sessions. Um, so Rebecca is going to share a little bit about kind of the youth impressions of the curriculum. Hello. Uh, the youth were very engaged. Um, as you heard, Simone, once you get them there, uh, they want to participate. Uh, they get very involved with the games. They become their own advocates. They become their own experts, other people's experts on sexual and reproductive health. Uh, participants are, were really interested in fact-based questions about SCIs, birth control, um, for instance, in December, the instructors uh, were educating youth that an easy way to remember STIs that are not curable started with an H, like herpes, HIV, hepatitis, HPV. Uh, we discussed uh, basic biology that these are viral infections, not bacterial. And of course, now, to add a little bit more confusion, hepatitis C sometimes can be curable. And so, of course, that caused an uproar, you know. They were very, very into getting the facts right. Um, other equally important comments and uh, discussion topics were around um, personal experiences, uh, about their own uh, reproductive experiences, and Yelp, the youth felt very confident and safe enough to make those comments in our space, which was amazing. Um, somebody talked about after your class, I went and got tested, and I had my partner tested, and now we're going to start thinking about birth control. That, for me, was amazing. It was normalizing reproductive health education. It was decreasing stigmas, um, doing so many things that that youth didn't know was extremely important for this curriculum. Um, uh, also, birth control. Uh, uh, side effects and effectiveness were a really uh, big topic, and people were asking me as a nurse, like, which one should I go on? What, you know, what one would be best for me? And in those instances, I would have them go back to Ultimate, which we coupled with. Um, you know, I'm like, I'm a nurse. I can't see you right now. You should probably see your doctor. But it was a great transition to get them to think about their own health in this way. 
other participants had questions about uh, private issues that they asked me on breaks, on lunch. Um, they asked me simple things like, how do I see a doctor? What do I say if I want to get tested? What kind of birth control should I take? I think somebody needs to take a look at this or this happened to me at one point. So these are all things to be prepared for um, with this curriculum. Uh, there's some really, really positive things and like breaking down that stigma, um, getting, uh, have a normalizing effect on and taking control of their, their reproductive health. But there are going to be some other uh, situations where you do get that, you know, um, those stories of this happened to me, I feel like this, I don't feel good about the situation. And that is something that as a educator, um, as a, uh, somebody that's participating with the youth that you will probably get. Um, the general, general um, reaction though was very fun. People were competitive. People wanted to learn. People wanted to uh, tell the other uh, participants, no, you got this wrong. I got this right. I could put a condom on better than you can. Um, that was a game. <laughs> um, and on the next slide, you will see that there are actual um, responses uh, to the Making Proud Choices training. Most people said that it was helpful. Uh, that they will think about using safe sex practices, uh, use condoms properly, and this is what we're really looking for, is a change in behavior that they're going to implement this in their, in their sexual practice, that they will think about getting tested, that they will think about um, starting birth control if that's right for them. And we always stress, you know, this is not right for everybody, whatever you would choose, uh, you can choose, but here are all your options. And I'm going to turn this back to Simone. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca, for sharing about that. Um, now we are going to turn it over, or we're going to move into our next kind of last section of the webinar. How do you do this in your county? Um, we want to really talk through what steps might um, a county might take that's wanting to implement workshops like these. The first step is to determine whether your county has a provider offering comprehensive sexual education. The first thing to do is really determine um, whether your county is covered by what's called the Personal Responsibility Education Program, PrEP, or the Information and Education Program called INE. Um, first, I'm gonna share about PrEP, as you can see here on the slide. Um, PrEP is a federally funded program. It's administered at the state level. They fund organizations in specific areas across the state to educate youth on abstinence and contraception to prevent pregnancy and STIs. So PrEP is not in every county. It covers 20 counties um, because it's based on what's called a, a medical services study area eligibility. Um, areas are basically scored using what's called the California Adolescent Sexual Health Needs Index. This index looks at a bunch of different factors than areas with scores over 200 are designated as, as high needs, and they met, meet eligibility for PrEP. So if you're just kind of wondering, why isn't my county included? Um, that's what it's based on. And um, you can see the youth who are eligible to receive services from PrEP um, providers are on the, it's on the screen there, and it includes foster youth. And the age range is generally 10 through 19, except for parenting youth, it's up to age 21. Um, so Ultimed, for example, is a PrEP provider. Some Planned Parenthoods are PrEP providers. Um, there's a fact sheet there on the screen if, if you want to learn more. Um, the Information and Education Program, very similarly, um, but it's a, it's a state-funded program, however, um, but very similarly um, offers you know, education to youth in the community. Um, also administered by the Department of Public Health. Um, and like PrEP, it's not in all counties. It's just in nine counties. And you can see the target populations on the screen as well. And that also includes current and former foster youth ages 12 to 19. So uh, where are PrEP and INE providers? So you can see across both programs, 22 counties are covered by at least you know, one program. Um, if you aren't one of these counties, don't worry. Um, all counties have Planned Parenthood. So Planned Parenthood um, 
you know, often offers comprehensive sexual education. Um, and to clarify, many Planned Parenthood affiliates are, in fact, also PrEP providers um, in their area. Um, and often these PrEP providers or INE providers or plant and or Planned Parenthood affiliates are sometimes actually the entity that's providing the comprehensive sexual education in the schools. Um, so they are doing this in the schools, some, um, but they also are qualified to just do this, you know, in the community. And so far, um, the people at the state level that I've spoken to from these programs and the local providers um, I've spoken to have been incredibly helpful and are in the process of engaging in discussion about how they can support counties to meet SB 89 requirements. Um, I'd like to invite um, Arlene from Altamed to just talk very briefly about what um, about Altamed's role as a prep provider. You know, what do they provide and how does it work? Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to be going over some of the services that we provide at Altamed. So as a prep grantee, we do education, and we primarily use the curriculum of making proud choices. However, other prep grantees may use other curriculum. Um, including like Cuidate, which we've used as well in the past, or SHARP, um, or Power Through Choices. Through our MPC education, we're able to do, you know, at school-based um, implementation sessions, and that's really where we see a lot of the youth. Um, and we also are able to do them at community-based organizations, and we actually have a program here at Altamed for pregnant and parenting teens through our youth services department. So we also coordinate with them in-house to see, uh, you know, very similar to kind of the program that we did with um, John Burton, where they kind of do case management, and then they can kind of refer them to our sessions. And we usually sch schedule, like, when there's a break, for example, like spring break or winter break. And we're able to kind of see the youth during those times. Um, when the youth complete the education, they're actually given an incentive. And it's a smaller than the one that we provided with John Burton, but it's usually a movie ticket or a gift card of some kind. And they get that upon completing 75% of the program. With part of education, we also have a pre and a post survey. And so that's kind of like also an incentive for us to give it to them once they completed the exit survey, they can receive their their incentive. Although the surveys are not um, like required, it's completely optional and voluntary for them to do so. It definitely gives us some feedback on how we're doing with the program. We also, in addition to our education, we also try to link all of our patients who need services or participants who need services to care back to our ultimate clinics. So we actually have a team center for youth to come by and they can just hang out if they want to or get any information that they may need. And we also enroll them into Family Pact if they need it. And where that through that program, they can receive birth control, STD testing, emergency contraception. And so our team center is located in Southgate. But if they do not live anywhere near that area, then we also have our other ultimate clinics and we can help them through our teen center hotline. So through our hotline information, they can share with us the services that they need and we can kind of give them a call back and let them know like, okay, this you might be living, for example, in East LA, right? So we'll tell them like, okay, there's three clinics in East LA, whichever one's the closest for you, we can make that appointment and it'll be confidential and it can be covered by the Family Park Program if they need it. So that's something that we kind of do um, throughout all of the different education sessions is let them know that we're there as a resource. And we also give them resources in their community. So we also let them know of other resources that are available. If maybe they don't feel comfortable going to Altamed or even how to talk to their provider, their primary care provider, if they are interested in birth control and because it can also be confidential. So letting them know, you know, this, it still can be confidential, even if you're covered um, through other like insurance, you can, still receive those services and how they can kind of navigate, you know, getting the services that they need. So this is a little bit about us. If you guys, um, I know our information will be listed. So if you need, anyone wants to contact us, we are open to providing education in different community organizations. Thanks, Arlene. 
Um, so we are going to continue kind of moving along here. Step two, um, make contact with, with, a, with a provider. Um, you know, we've put together a list that includes both the INE providers and the PrEP providers, um, thanks to a very helpful person with the Department of Public Health. Um, we not only have the contact information for these providers, but we even know which curriculum they offer. That's amazing. Um, and that information lives on the webpage. You see the URL there on the screen. And coming soon, we'll have a similar list of all of the Planned Parenthood affiliates in the state. Another extremely helpful person we just became acquainted with at Planned Parenthood at one of the affiliates. Um, it's helping us put this list together so that counties can, you know, reach out to Planned Parenthood in their area um, and uh, start developing those, those relationships just like they they can do now with if they have PrEP or INE in their area. Um, and as soon as we have that, we'll send it out to everyone who registered for this webinar and post it on that website page there. Okay. Um, so one thing that the roster will include, this is Amy Lemley, uh, the Planned Parent roster is which ones do comprehensive sexual health education? Because we know many of you know your local Planned Parenthoods and can access the information from your local Planned Parenthoods, but we're really trying to find where in each affiliate the comprehensive sexual health education lives. Um, so next step, we know share information about SB 89. Um, and so be that connective tissue. You know, uh, the PrEP providers are uh, informed about it. Uh, that many of the I and E uh, providers are informed about it and so are Planned Parenthood. But um, if they aren't, or if, they, if it's not resonating, you know, bring that information forth. And um, the California Department of Social Services um, has information about on, a, on a very good uh, web page they have about Healthy Sexual Development Project. And then our organization has what we call a SB 89 implementation page. And so both of these sources of information are a one-stop shop for, all right, what are we talking about? What, what is this? What's going on? Um, if you need a fact sheet, um, trying to just um, have something to be able to share to get that conversation rolling. So the next step is you've, you've found your provider, um, you've shared some information, and then it's really about a conversation. Um, and so, you know, the, we're very in a very early stage of implementation. You know, most counties are more focused on tracking um, if young people are getting it in school, as they should be. That's job one. But now we're talking about for those who can't, um, how are we going to do that? And so some questions to think about the comprehensive sexual health educated or providing learning about what they currently do, learning if you can fold foster youth into what they already do, um, or, you know, do they have the existing, could, could the foster youth fold into their existing um, prep budget, or do they need additional resources? Um, is there a minimum number of participants that could be served? And so these are the real nuts and bolts questions, like, can we work together? How can we work together? How can it be um, something that is, you know, mutually beneficial? Um, and it is, uh, and then information for the Child Welfare Agency is, you know, how many foster youth do we expect will require this outside the public school? Um, and what are going to be their age? And where in your county, and I think this is a very important one, where does this live? Where administratively, who is thinking about this? in your county. Um, it could be a lot of different places, but getting clarity, um, and, if, and as you leave this web seminar, who's, who's taking the lead on this, on having this conversation and doing, uh, doing this work? Uh, next step is really determining who's gonna play, uh, next slide please, um, who is gonna play the role of convener. Um, I don't wanna harp on this, but this role um, is extremely important. Um, is who is going to, um, you know, the county is the county and they, you know, have the care and custody of the dependents and the health care provider or the CSC provider, they're experts in comprehensive sexual health education. We need to make these parties meet. Um, and so just really thinking, uh, not neglecting that role, you know, here on the slide, it could be a lot of different entities. Um, there's not a right way to do it, but it does have to be done just expecting uh, that to happen um, by either the county or the uh, provider will probably mean you could have an empty room. Um, so last but not least is really give some thought about whether you want to go above and beyond for higher risk young people. 
Um, and these are three groups, young people who are placed in group homes or STRTPs, young people who are custodial parents and young people who are LGBTQ. Each of them have special um, needs and uh, there's a case to be made for each of these groups um, to really, even if they're getting this in high school, um, would your county think potentially about going above and beyond, you know, partnering uh, to make sure these young people who, who do face higher risk of, um, of a variety of outcomes to make sure they're getting this quality curriculum. Uh, so it's just something to think about. Um, and um, I recently did a presentation at the California Alliance of Child and Family Services, and I found uh, many of the people in the room were SDRTP providers and group home providers. They were excited about trying to meet the needs of these young people. They know the risks they face. And so I think there's a real potential in, in that kind of partnership and other partnerships um, to make sure this content uh, makes its way to them. So again, uh, those are some, some high level steps to take. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's patience as we, um, as we did go over time. I think we've learned our lesson this time. We thought we were gonna cut it short, but now we know it's 90 minutes. We can always leave early, but it's no fun to have it go over. So I'm gonna turn it over to Simone, who's gonna facilitate our Q&A. We're only going to take a handful of questions, and uh, then we will wrap up for today. Thanks, Amy. So our first question, um, and I think the person said that they got this answered, but I still want to ask it in case anyone else is, is confused about this. They wanted to know, is making proud choices specifically for foster youth, or is it for all youth? And the, the answer to that is, it is for all youth. Um, but there are different versions of making proud choices. One of the versions is specifically for out of out of home care, youth in out of home care. It's been slightly um, altered to um, to kind of meet some specific needs. Kind of uh, you know, not talking about um, you know being in a um, being in your family's home, but being you know in foster care. There's just some slight differences in in the language and in some of the scenarios. Um, and it um, is the version that we used in the pilot, but it is probably not the version that you will be receiving um, for meeting the SB 89 requirements. That'll be probably the California version, very similar, um, but it is for all youth. Um, next question, um, I'd like to ask this of um, either uh, Lisette or Arlene. Um, you guys have been uh, educating you know, for a long time in the community on this topic, and you guys have been specifically delivering um, making proud choices for a long time. What do you think the biggest strength of the curriculum is? Oh, um, Lizette so and Arlene. Think, oh, there you go. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Lizette accidentally uh, hung up when she was unmuting, uh, but I can help answering for that. We feel that the strength is in the relationship building. So the curriculum really takes time in the beginning to talk to the youth um, about their goals and their dreams. And that can kind of help them open up because this is a sensitive subject for most people. Um, it kind of helps us to build the relationships. And then having a lot of discussions and games, uh, things like that can kind of like help open up the conversation for them so that they can feel comfortable. And that's definitely one of the strengths. And we we also feel that it, it covers the information in a way that's really relatable. There's a lot of videos, which, you know, besides the lecturing and like kind of explaining to them on that level, also the videos kind of help show like what it could look like in real life to get an STD, to get testing. Um, and so that kind of, we feel that that's a strength as well. Thanks, Arlene. Um, another question about the curriculum. How is Making Proud Choices relevant for LGBTQ youth? Um, does anyone, Rebecca, Lisa, Arlene, does, do any of you want to take this question? Well, uh, sure, Dr. Rebecca. Great, Rebecca, okay. you want to take this um, question? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, we have some LGBTQ youth that did actually have um, some concerns. Uh, so one of the things that Wendy, who's not on this call, uh, and I went over was dental dam and how uh, you know reproductive health is still valid 
for um, youth who are are queer or gay, um, and that there are ways to um, protect uh, themselves as well. Um, and also meet my own understanding as a nurse, um, when we were talking about uh, this very subject in uh, February, I know that approximately 80% of um, people who are gay, lesbian, uh, transgender, other, uh, have sex throughout their lifetime with um, a, in a heteronormative way. Um, as an experiment, as something uh, other, um, but uh, you know, we had to explain uh, in the curriculum that just because you are a, let's say, a lesbian or a gay man, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be tested as well. Um, it's, uh, because people think about uh, pregnancy as the main outcome of having sex. Um, so I felt like that. Uh, really resonated with some of our youth. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, that was really helpful. Um, I think our last question here, because I know we are at 1120 now, um, is what is the cost for an agency to purchase the California edition of Making Proud Choices? So this would be for an organization or an agency that actually wanted to purchase the curriculum to deliver it. And just an FYI, if you are delivering this curriculum yourself, you have to get extensive training. And it's not something you just kind of buy and deliver. It's uh, go through a whole process. Um, the cost of actually purchasing Making Proud Choices is $648. That includes the facilitator curriculum, the activity set, the DVDs, the um, 30 student workbooks. Um, but that doesn't include the cost of the training and the potentially uh, you having to fly to another state or another city to receive that training and paying for hotel and all of that. So it is more than that, but that is the cost. 648 is the cost of the actual curriculum. Um, and uh, just to clarify, if you're going through like PrEP or an INE provider or your Planned Parenthood that provides comprehensive sexual education, they have the curriculum. You don't need to purchase it for them. So that cost is eliminated there. Um, and uh, they, they tend to have the materials that you know, go with the curriculum um, as well. I also saw that there was someone commented that there was a slight um, error on the list. They, they were both a PrEP and an INE grantee, but they were just listed as one or the other. We will double check that um, for all the, the everyone on that list. Make sure it's correct, um, and uh, and you know and put out uh, a revised version. I also invite those who are INE providers or prep providers on the line to make sure you look at the list. If you see something on there that's wrong, or if say the person whose contact information is on there has changed or is different, please let us know so we can keep it updated. Um, and lastly. Um, Someone said, how can I receive the copy of the curriculum? So related to what I just said, um, you would go to ETR, the owners of the curriculum, and you would order it through them. They are also the ones who can provide the training. Um, so with that, um, I'll just say we have recorded this. We will be sending it out to everyone. We will send out, I know that I put a chat message out to everyone. Some people are saying the link to that web page where the list is isn't working. Um, some people obviously it is working for because they've looked at it, but I will send it out again to make sure, you know, in the body of an email so that you definitely have it, definitely easy to get to, and um, that will go out later today with the other materials. Thanks so much to our presenters, and thanks to everyone who was able to join us today. Bye-bye.